Free the next generation. Free the next generation. Free the next generation. I can hear the children of my land are crying. Cause I'll leave a failure and I've done no pain. Mother to child at back transmission. 90% of them with lifetime infection. But all oh, mothers, it's a happy day. Introducing hepatitis B back doors. We have got we have got the vaccine now. Hey, hepatitis B. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. I just wanted to review the agenda quickly with our speakers. So um, Dr. Ward and Dr. Jaguna will welcome everyone. Then Dr. Kabore will have some opening remarks. And then Dr. Jaguna will give us a few data points to set the stage. And then the first section of the program will be on policy development related to birth dose. And we'll have Dr. Wayaswa from the Uganda NITAG and then Dr. Kachala from the Malawi Ministry of Health. And then we'll have the research section with Dr. Shumakawa, Dr. Nadal and Dr. Nayagam. And then we'll have their advocacy section with Dr. Adije, Mr. Emmanuel, Mr. Arafat, Mr. Maziko, Mr. Ifiani, Mr. Kenneth um, from our wonderful civil society representatives. And then we'll end with discussion today. So just let me know if you have any questions on the program. And we're about a minute away from eight o'clock, John. So just let me know when we wanna get started.
All right, let's begin. Lindsay, please. Free the next generation. Free the next generation. Free the next generation. I can hear the children of my land are crying. Cause I'll leave a failure and I've done no pain. Mother to child at back transmission. 90% of them with lifetime infection. But all matters, it's a happy day. Introducing hepatitis B back doors. We have got we have got the vaccine now. Hey, hepatitis B is one now. No more liver cancer now. Hepatitis B can be prevented through a timely vaccine given to babies in the first 24 hours of life. We call upon government to introduce the hepatitis B backdoors. This will give every child an equitable chance to survive and thrive in life. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health in partnership with the Hepatitis Aid Organization with support from the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination and CDC. Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. John Ward, Director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination. It's a real privilege to um, uh, uh, welcome you today to our a webinar uh, to explore how we can improve prevention of mother to child transmission in Africa, indeed, um, save the next generation uh, in Africa from uh, chronic hepatitis B and the risk of liver failure and liver cancer in, in later life. Um, I, let me just uh, thank uh, just to uh, provide just to uh, send my personal. Uh, uh, hello to everyone that we uh, that I've had the pleasure and the coalition has the pleasure to work with on this important aspect of global hepatitis B elimination. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in Africa, and I'm glad that we're uh, getting increased attention to it, increased resources uh, to it, so that we can truly eliminate hepatitis B transmission uh, um, for children in Africa and progressively um, generations. Um, uh, going forward. Um, so we have a very interesting webinar, I believe, today. Uh, let me just give you a few housekeeping items. Uh, uh, this is uh, translated uh, and available in both English and French by clicking on the uh, globe and where it says interpretation and, and clicking the channel uh, that you would like to um, access the uh, audio on. Um, it should be fairly straightforward. Uh, you can also, please, I encourage you to uh, update your uh, name in the uh, by going to the uh, participant list, uh, clicking there on the uh, right side of your name where it says more, and you can hit rename, and then you can uh, please put in an organization in your country so that um, uh, we can help others uh, get to know you uh, and really uh, build this community of practice that we're trying to uh, do our part to put together. Uh, uh, for um, hepatitis B birth dose and perinatal hepatitis B uh, elimination in, uh, in Africa. Um, this, in the contrast to a um, uh, webinar, this is a Zoom meeting, meaning that everyone has audio and video capability. And so uh, hopefully, in addition to seeing the speakers, of course, uh, as uh, persons have questions, uh, uh, they can also uh, come on uh, video again to try to strengthen this community of practice for helping uh, everyone know each other. Um, we'll have a short Q&A um, after each section, and then we'll have a, a more in-depth discussion period uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you do have a question, please raise your hand so we can identify you. You can also put your uh, questions in chat, of course, um, and I'll encourage the speakers you know, after their remarks, if you have clarifying questions, they can go ahead and um, answer those in the chat. And then you have um, questions that need more, um, you know, in-depth discussion and engaging multiple speakers or other um, persons on the call. We'll do our best to um, call on you so you can bring those um, to the floor, you know, on your own. Um, you know, that said, as it is a Zoom meeting, Please, uh, please mute uh, your uh, your uh, audio so that you don't get, we don't get um, inadvertent interruptions into the uh, presentations. 
Um, so I, I mean, uh, we'll, that will be greatly um, appreciated. Uh, this meeting is recorded, uh, so it will be available later on the coalition website at globalhep.org. Uh, uh, we also will uh, produce it into the individual presentations, um, and the uh, slide sets will also be available in our webinar section uh, on globalhep.org. Uh, um, um, the coalition has been working uh, in along our three pillars of activities to improve um, uh, hepatitis B prevention um, uh, for infants uh, in Africa. Um, this webinar is a one aspect of our efforts to build a community of practice. We've had a series of webinars a lot, um, over the last uh, year and a half. Some of those conducted in collaboration uh, with St. Paul Medical Center uh, in Ethiopia. Um, and so we uh, greatly appreciate uh, that collaboration. Again, that, uh, that content is available on our, uh, on our website. Uh, we will also be hearing uh, from um, uh, civil society organizations that with support from CDC, we've been able to provide resources for those organizations to um, improve awareness of hepatitis B vaccination and the benefits of vaccination um, for uh, children in Africa. And you'll be hearing of their efforts uh, in that regard. Um, and then technical assistance activities, uh, you'll also be getting some um, 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 updates of, uh, particularly around operational research, some really some very promising uh, um, improvements in um, um, screening to identify pregnant women at high risk for uh, transmission uh, through perinatal exposures to their infant, and the and the um, planning of a new study to to evaluate the effectiveness of hepatitis B birth dose vaccination um, in Africa. So the agenda uh, quickly will uh, start with um, a status report uh, from the WHO regional office and from my uh, colleague, Dr. Henry Njaguna uh, here in the coalition. We'll then uh, check in on um, the, uh, the country that's most recently moved toward uh, introducing hepatitis B uh, birth dose vaccination, and that's in Uganda, and then in a country at an earlier stage of that um, um, recommendation development process in Malawi. We'll then uh, look at uh, some research updates that I've already mentioned, and then the work of civil society organizations, and then we'll uh, end with uh, discussion. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so I think at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Julian Gabori, who's uh, with the uh, WHO um, uh, Office of the African Region. Uh, Julian? I think you're on mute, Julian. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, John. Yeah, okay. thank you, John, and <laughs> thank you, John, and good good afternoon and good morning and good evening wherever you are, everybody. So I am Dr. Julian Kabore, and I'm the focal point for uh, hepatitis B vaccination in the African uh, region, and I'm based in the regional office for WHO, and I'm based in in Brazzaville. So after the successful launch of the community of practice towards the introduction and scale up of the birth dose uh, of hepatitis B vaccine in the Afro region last year. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you again today for this virtual meeting titled Hepatitis B Birth Dose in the African Region, Bridging Science and Advocacy to Eliminate Mother to Child Transmission of uh, Hepatitis B Virus. As you know, the African region has the highest prevalence of hepatitis B uh, among children less than five years of age, and it stands at 2.53%. And it's the only region, it's in the only WHO region that didn't meet the global target of reaching a prevalence of less than 1% by 2020. So hepatitis B vaccination coverage among children in the region, in the region is also the lowest among all regions, with the third dose of the hepatitis B uh, vaccine coverage among infants standing at 71%, while the birth dose vaccine coverage is as low as 17%. So however, a lot of efforts have been made uh, to fill particularly the data gap in the region 
and those are, was done through modeling to estimate the prevalence of the infection, as well as the impact of introducing the hepatitis B birth dose vaccine, in addition to the three doses given to infants already in the regions as part of the pentavalent, starting at six or eight weeks after birth. Also, we have seen progress with the introduction of, um, and with the inclusion of hepatitis B testing among uh, children in national uh, surveys, such as the uh, demographic health surveys. And then an example that was done in, in, in Mauritania last year. And we have also seen some continued effort to estimate the burden of mother to child transmission to large scales of studies. And for instance, we have partners that have been currently conducting studies in Ghana and also in Ethiopia that is planned. Okay. While progress has been made in the generation of evidence, also continued advocacy are led to the introduction or plan to introduce the birth dose vaccine in routine schedule uh, in countries like Burkina Faso that has, that has introduced the birth dose this year in April 2022. And also as uh, John mentioned early in Uganda that is planning to introduce and also we have Ethiopia that is also in the same uh, process. So however, uh, as progress has been made, we need to really pay attention to the COVID pandemic uh, and its current response, which has been kind of strengthening the progress towards the control and elimination of hepatitis B in the region. And this is reflected by the progress, um, this has been reflected by the decline in the coverage of infant vaccination that decreased from 75% pre-COVID vaccine in 2019 to currently 71% uh, in 2021. So this decline in hepatitis B infant vaccination coverage calls for an urgent need to implement measures such as catch up hepatitis B vaccination and mostly for us to introduce and scale up hepatitis B birth dose uh, vaccination to ensure sustained progress toward hepatitis B elimination by 20. And I am sure you may have, you all have appreciated the music and I was really impressed to even hear this advocacy music that was uh, played at the, at the beginning. And I know that together with this community of practice, I'm confident that we can respond to this challenge, helping countries in the region to generational evidence and this kind of advocacy that we just saw that can make big impact and also for the implementation of other necessary activities. And I thank you all for participating in this and particularly the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination for organizing this webinar. And I wish you all a successful virtual meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, really uh, excellent and inspiring comments. Let me um, turn it over to Henry to, to um, provide a little bit more information about where we are with hepatitis B birth dose uh, vaccination as well as infant vaccination in Africa, Henry. Thank you very much, John, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Dr. Henry Juguna from the Coalition of, for Global Hepatitis Elimination here at the Task Force for Global Health. Uh, it's a, my pleasure to meet you all again after many uh, months uh, past that we have not been able to convene such of these meetings, and it's a pleasure uh, to talk about uh, the things that we're going to talk about today in setting the stage uh, for the discussions that we're going to have. Uh, Julian has made my work easier. Uh, he has pointed out a few uh, uh, a few highlights, uh, which I'm going to talk about. Next slide, uh, 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 see. Uh, like Julian said, um, Africa has the lowest coverage for hepatitis B birthdose vaccine, which at 2021, in 2021 was estimated at 17%. This is the lowest uh, in terms of uh, comparing with the other uh, World Health Organization regions. Uh, the global average is at uh, 42%, and the region that has the highest uh, coverage, that is the Western Pacific region, has the highest uh, at estimated at uh, 78%. And this is based on the new uh, WHO UNICEF data. Um, uh, so we still have a big gap when you look at um, uh, the, 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 the region that follows Africa uh, is almost uh, twice. Uh, so um, we still have a long way when it comes to the hepatitis B birth dose uh, coverage. Next slide, please. 
Um, we only have 15 countries, uh, if you count uh, Ethiopia, uh, the recently added country that has introduced the birth rate based on uh, some personal communication from WHO, uh, making some slight progress, which is encouraging. But I think if we can have more countries coming up, uh, and we are really encouraged by the fact that uh, Uganda, uh, the UNITAG, recently made a recommendation for hepatitis B birth rate introduction. And later on in the discussions today, we are going to hear from uh, a representative from uh, UNITAG who is going to talk about the experiences in making this particular recommendation. And we hope that these lessons from these countries, sharing the experiences, will be able to inspire other countries to be able to make uh, this uh, uh, important decision of introducing the birth vaccine, which is very important in preventing mother-to-child transmission and early infant uh, transmission before the onset of uh, infant vaccination. Next slide, please. Um, According to the recent data from uh, WHO and UNICEF, uh, the coverage uh, for hepatitis B birth rate vaccine uh, is challenged because uh, we have very few countries uh, that have these estimates, uh, 19 out of uh, 14 countries, if you consider the countries that had introduced the birth rate vaccine prior to uh, 2021. Um, so we only have nine, uh, nine countries having these data. Uh, but looking at these data, what is encouraging is that uh, most of the countries, uh, with the exception of Gambia, most of the countries have uh, coverage estimates that are much more than the global average. Uh, we have a, a country like Algeria having a 99% uh, coverage. We have a country like uh, Cabo Verde that has 96% coverage. Very encouraging, meaning that it's possible that uh, countries, once they introduce uh, the hepatitis B birth rate vaccine, it's possible that they are going to be able to um, uh, achieve high coverage. Uh, but having said that, uh, we still have challenges. We can see that some countries were uh, impacted heavily when it comes to uh, the pandemic uh, of COVID-19, uh, with countries such as uh, Tome and Principe having a, a, a reduction of up to 26%. Uh, and Senegal too, having a reduction of 7%. Uh, all this means that we need to we still have a lot of work to be done uh, to making sure that we increase this coverage of this particular vaccine. Next slide, please. Having said that, uh, like Julian did mention, the pandemic has led to a decline in infant uh, hepatitis B, uh, uh, especially the third dose that is given at uh, 14 weeks in most African countries, we have had a decline, a, a very major decline. Uh, and, and, and as shown in the table there, uh, we have about uh, um, uh, 24 countries in Africa uh, in the map uh, having shown uh, declines in, in coverage of, of that particular vaccine. And most of, and, and it, of these countries having more than 10% uh, decline in 2021 compared to uh, the pandemic estimates. Uh, of 2019. Uh, this, 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 this goes ahead in, in, in telling us that we still have a lot of work when it comes to uh, protecting future generations against hepatitis B virus infection. We need to also uh, focus on uh, the infant uh, vaccination as well to make sure that uh, all these future generations are protected. And with that, uh, finally, as I conclude, I would uh, encourage uh, the people who are going to speak to, uh, of course, uh, share as much as you can uh, in this particular session whereby we have brought this community of practice together so that we can be able to learn from each other and together we can uh, save Africa future generations against hepatitis B virus infection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. And, um... Uh, you know, as you can see, we have a lot of uh, work to do to get hepatitis B introduced and then to um, um, help to, uh, help immunization programs um, uh, recover and, um, and and get back on track with the completion of um, three-dose infant hepatitis B vaccination. But as Henry mentioned, uh, uh, Uganda uh, is the country uh, where the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group uh, went through the process of looking at the evidence and and developed a recommendation to forward to the Ministry of Health uh, recommending that uh, uh, routine hepatitis B birth dose vaccination be introduced into the country. Um, so we're very excited about that. And we're very uh, we we recognize that these uh, 
immunization groups are really the starting point for that type of um, introduction to occur uh, in other countries in Africa. So we, we really appreciate Dr. Peter Weyazma uh, from the uh, Uganda National Immunization Technical Advisory Group to um, give some remarks about that process in Uganda and, and where introduction stands at this point. Uh, Peter? Uh, thank you so much. Um, I need to share my slides. Uh, maybe somebody, you could share my slides because I'm failing to get them from the screen. Uh, okay, thank you so much. So my name is uh, Peter Weiswa and uh, I'm a member of the NITAC for the last, sorry, my screen, my camera is not showing for some reason, uh, but uh, my name is uh, Peter Weiswa and I'm a member of the NITAC for the last about six years. I'm also an associate professor at McKay University School of Public Health College of Sciences. I'm going to be speaking about Uganda NITAG decision process for recommending hepatitis B birth dose. Next slide. So uh, the Uganda NITAG was set up in 2014, um, which was um, uh, by the Ministry, the Minister of Health. We are comprised of 12 core members who come from different specialties. Those are medicine, microbiology, pediatrics, health policy, vaccinology, epidemiology, and social sciences. A key criteria for membership, one is expertise, and the second one is independence. And uh, this is one of our core values that we stick to as a NITAC. Although we are appointed by the minister, we, we are quite independent from, from the ministry. We are supported also by liaison members from WHO and also from the EPI program, UNICEF, uh, PASS, and civil society. And sometimes we call on other people to give us advice, including from WHO for Geneva or CIVAC or anywhere, depending on where the additional expertise can be gotten. Uh, so back in 2017, uh, the Minister of Health requested NITAC to uh, give a recommendation how to consider if uh, the hepatitis B dose could be introduced in Uganda. And um, uh, so we reviewed it at that time. And interesting at that time, we didn't have a positive recommendation. And uh, uh, again, the minister came back to us uh, to review again in 2022, where we had um, a different recommendation. Next slide. So uh, the Uganda NITAG uses uh, an evidence-based process. And I think this is one of the things which puts us aside that we use evidence in a criteria that is basically, uh, it, it can't be repeated and um, is transparent and, and it makes us quite accountable. Uh, so we have a recommendation framework that we use to review the evidence and also make the recommendation. And the, I'm going to be uh, going through this briefly about some of the things that we consider. First of all, for hepatitis B, we look at the disease, the burden of the disease, I think, which we've talked about. And definitely the, the disease is a major burden in Uganda, especially in the northern parts of the country. So issues around burden of disease, are that okay. kind of uh, evidence is uh, critical. And then uh, the use of, uh, of, of cost, uh, uh, cost to the healthcare system, and also if there are alternative prevention and control measures. Uh, that is also important information because it must be affordable, but also if the alternatives, then why not take the, take the alternative if the alternative is better? So those are some of the things that we consider. Next slide. Uh, we also look at uh, the vaccine and the immunization characteristics. And uh, one of those things that we look at is the safety of the vaccine. And the, uh, this is important criteria. And definitely we know that the vaccine is, 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 is safe. 
but also we look at the efficacy of and the effectiveness of the vaccine. It's not just enough to say the vaccine is recommended by WHO. And I think that is a very important point that uh, we, we the NITA goes through. We also look how did WHO make these decisions? So some of the things we look at in terms of efficacy and effectiveness of vaccine, uh, we look at um, like what is the immune response or immu immunogenicity of the vaccine when administered at dose, I mean at birth, compared to when it is at six weeks, because we already have this vaccine as part of the parental variant at six weeks. Uh, so uh, then we look at other things like uh, the risk of hepatitis B infection with the vaccine, uh, I mean, in terms of Africa and also worldwide. Questions like, what is the efficacy of hepatitis B birth dose in reducing the risk of, of uh, hepatitis B transmission uh, when given at birth compared to when given later. So these are some of the things that uh, we consider. I'm not going to go through each of them, just to assure you that we use an evidence-based process. Next slide. So in this evidence-based process, we actually, we do several things, including systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and also we do uh, a cost effectiveness analysis. And also we explore its effect on the health system. Can the health system handle uh, this vaccine? So uh, back in the 2017, the Uganda did not recommend the introduction of hepatitis B birth dose in 2017, because one, we found that the, the, the level uh, of evidence that uh, was used to recommend this vaccine by WHO was uh, labeled as a moderate, uh, so not very high. And the first, that was an important thing. But also we looked at their studies in Africa that showed that it works in Africa. This is quite important, and I'm going to be speaking about this a little bit more, the importance of local data. There was also a lack of, lack of local data on hepatitis B uh, burden. Uh, and, this, and the effectiveness of the vaccine. We didn't find much in Africa. Most of the studies were coming from Asia. And the, there was some thinking that the context in Asia uh, is a bit different from the African context. But also we looked at uh, the feasibility uh, uh, concerns uh, within the 24 hours of uh, giving uh, the vaccine uh, post-delivery. So, one, there are code chain issues, requirements. Can we have this vaccine everywhere where mothers are giving birth? Or, and then at that time also the attendance of deliveries in Uganda, th this was about 50% to 60% attendance of facility deliveries. But you know, even facility deliveries means everything, people in a small clinic without, um, um, uh, a, uh, let's say fridge, and there was also no police on screening of pregnant women. At that time, there was a recommendation that um, you needed actually to, uh, to test first before you give the vaccine. And also, uh, as I said, health first deliveries, we are low. Next slide. So there are issues to do with the capacity also of the system. Uh, this, is, um, this table is actually picked from the WHO uh, at the WHO document at the time where the recommendation was made. Uh, so it was, what is the overall quality of the evidence for critical outcomes? And as you can see, in terms of effectiveness of the intervention, it was labeled as moderate. But later when we went into studies in Africa, they were inconclusive. So there was moderate quality of evidence to support the effectiveness of the hepatitis B uh, vaccine given within 24 hours uh, of birth to prevent uh, HBV infection. So that was uh, one of the things that um, uh, we considered at the time. Uh, next slide. So as I said, uh, in 2017, the recommendation was not positive, but uh, again, last year, uh, the government requested us to have another look, and uh, we went through the same process, but also invited WHO to make a presentation 
uh, the Minister of Health make a presentation. And the sources of data that we looked at, now we had gotten more data from Uganda. The 2016 National Surveillance Report for Disease Prevalence uh, had been released. When we looked at, uh, when we made the recommendation in 2017, this report was not out. This provided more evidence around the burden, but even among those students who had been vaccinated at six weeks. Then also the WHO hepatitis B bus dose position paper for hepatitis B bus dose vaccine characteristics. So that was also available to us. There were also systematic reviews that we did, and also the WHO report on introduction and the feasibility of performance of um, this vaccine in Africa. So evidence from Africa was important in informing us on what we can do. And also the Minister of Health draft policy on uh, hepatitis B bus dose, because the ministry, despite our recommendation, considered, uh, I mean, continued uh, doing the policy and advocacy. Then also the Minister of Health, the Minister of Health data on the feasibility of introducing this uh, vaccine. And the minister had done a feasibility study and showed that it was possible to give it within 24 hours. And also data on, on cost effectiveness was also available. Next slide. So uh, based on all that, in the train, uh, early this year, we made a recommendation that Uganda should do, introduce the vaccine uh, because we had more evidence uh, from WHO, from other countries, but also from Uganda. Now, what are the plans for the introduction of the hepatitis B? And this is where the challenge is that, uh, although we made the recommendation, we know that most of these new vaccine introductions are funded by Gavi. And currently, uh, this is not one of the vaccine that is on the list. So, um, uh, so that is an issue, but the EPI has gone ahead to develop a strategy and has approached top management in the Ministry of Health and also in the government of Uganda so that the government can fund, but also at the same time, they have approached Gavi. And Gavi says, we have not yet made a decision, but we are, we are going to look at this. We're hoping for a positive result. Uh, but meanwhile, EPI is not sitting back. They are, they are soon going to train health workers on hepatitis B uh, but those introduction. This is as, as part of a general training on uh, vaccination, uh, especially for introduction of these new vaccines. So they are taking advantage that as they update health workers on vaccination, they can also update them on this new vaccine. And when it comes, they'll be more ready. Next. So what, what is my advice for other NITACs who have not yet re recommended Hep B birth dose introduction? I think uh, use always use evidence um, to, to do the work and call in experts as needed. Explore all types of evidence where there is no local data, then try to look further. And this might come in the similar settings. Sometimes it might come from South Asia. Uh, but it's good if it's uh, from Africa. There is also general advice. Uh, so what other, so this should be, what advice would, should I give in general to governments and funding partners? Uh, so my advice is invest in the generation of local evidence. So there is no way we are going to be making decisions which are evidence-based without local evidence. This is a major problem that NITACs face. So I think this is an area that needs investment. Uh, also, all countries that are trying to roll out these bus doors, they need uh, to continue as you roll out to generate evidence, because this evidence will be needed for continuous approval and investment. Is the investment, is the rollout working? Next slide. So thank you so much. I think that's briefly what I wanted to say about uh, the process that we went through and also the experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter. That was an excellent overview um, and really um, a lot of lessons learned there for uh, others that are participating in ITAGs uh, in their countries. I know CDC and uh, WHO Afro, or, or as, as we are here at the coalition, are very interested to see how we can assist that process. Um, and you um, certainly uh, provided uh, an excellent um, 
overview of how of what that process uh, can be um, in a, in in African countries. So thank you again. Um, let's turn now to um, uh, a country that, as I mentioned, uh, is a little bit earlier in this process. Uh, my pleasure uh, to rec uh, to um, uh, welcome Dr. Rabson Kachala and Dr. Wangani Mazmara uh, from from the Malawi Ministry of Health to talk about the, the status of hepatitis B birth dose. Uh, uh, introduction in uh, Malawi. Uh, Rapson? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, receive warm heart of Africa greetings from Malawi. We, we hope uh, you are able to uh, hear from us. Uh, uh, welcome to our presentation uh, about the Malawi policy on Hebrides B birth dose and Malawi can't wait to start implementation. That's our presentation. Uh, we'll start with epidemiology. Uh, we currently, we don't have the population-based survey estimates for a B prevalence. Uh, however, with support from CDC, uh, we have already developed our protocol to conduct a population-based survey for a press B estimate uh, using the HIV uh, population-based MFIA samples, uh, which we did last year. So we we'll have the baseline uh, uh, data. However, we have local studies uh, from researchers, hospital data, as well as Malai blood transfusion service have shown varying prevalence of uh, 1.53 to 17% uh, hepatitis B virus infection uh, with a pool prevalence of 8.1% in Malawi. Next, I will take you through the, uh, the impact of hepatitis B birth dose in Malawi. Uh, <clears throat> As WHO has already alluded to, uh, it is one, a breast B uh, birth dose is one of the key service coverage targets for elimination of viral breast by 2030. As therefore, in Malawi, we, we have already done the um, mathematical modeling estimate uh, to show the impact of a breast B birth dose introduction. Uh, with or without treatment from 2020 to 20, 2095. And uh, it has shown that uh, starting from 60% uh, coverage to 90% coverage, birth dose, uh, as, uh, uh, if a breast B birth dose uh, is added as a prevention method, deaths and infection of a breast B can be significantly reduced. Uh, <clears throat> by 2016. And uh, uh, we, we can go next to, next slide, please. Then uh, we, with this uh, results, we showed to the uh, political will, which is, uh, I can say the strong political will in 2017, <clears throat> Uh, the Ministry of Health Authorities established the viral hepatitis program in, uh, within the HIV AIDS directorate for effective in integration because uh, the local studies have shown that a breast B uh, co infection with HIV ranges from 18% uh, percent to 30%. Percent. Therefore, for effective integration, we, it has been housed within the HIV AIDS directorate for effective integration. And uh, the Minister of Health in Malawi, uh, she's led to, to be the guest of honor in launching uh, both the national viral hepatitis strategy and the viral hepatitis management guidelines as part of the continuing the uh, commemorating the World uh, Hepatitis World uh, Day. But also the parliament has approved the budget of uh, about 40 million Malawi culture, which is equivalent to 39,000 US dollars for the procurement of a breast B birth dose in 2022 to 2023 financial year. This is to show commitment uh, to multilateral partners and bilateral partners that Malawi is committed uh, to the introduction of 
uh, birth dose as a, a prevention measure for hepatitis B. Next slide. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, Malawi have uh, uh, already resilient expanded program of immunization, API, with pentavirate coverage, uh, for instance, it's above 95%, and we have vibrant uh, uh, civil society organizations, which are uh, within this forum. Uh, so we feel that uh, this program of Everest B best dose uh, introduction uh, in Malawi will not have uh, much challenges because the EPI and the Advisory Council uh, are ready to support it accordingly with the uh, 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 office as well. So we are requesting GAV and the uh, multilateral health partners and bio partners to support Malawi health system financially in implementing hepatitis B birth dose effectively. Uh, we feel the Malawi will continue shining in, in uh, 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 vac uh, vaccina uh, vaccination. Uh, uh, we are been shining. Uh, we also feel uh, we will continue shining Malawi uh, with the introduction of Webres B uh, <clears throat> birth dose uh, in Malawi. So we are appealing to all partners uh, to support us accordingly. Uh, this is our presentation uh, as it regards to our stand on policy. We feel uh, this year uh, everything will actually come to fruition starting the implementation. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, thank you, Rabson. Uh, uh, any questions, please, please put them in the chat for, uh, for both of our speakers. Uh, Rabson, quickly, uh, what is the status of a night tag in uh, Malawi? I, 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 uh, um, and how do they fit into this um, um, introduction of hepatitis B birth uh, in the country? Yeah, the Immunization uh, Advisory Council with the Secretariat of the uh, EPI, uh, they have already in, endorsed the, uh, uh, the uh, breast B uh, birth dose, and uh, they are in the process of writing officially the uh, GAV uh, for the financial, uh, for financial support. And uh, we feel uh, they are also in co uh, collaboration with the WHO to show the commitment uh, with what Malawi have already done on the ground. Okay, thank you. And Peter, uh, you, uh, the 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 Unitag uh, went through this process, you know, during the COVID response, and did the um, did the you know COVID response uh, and you know in. in, in Enter into any discussions regarding feasibility, or you know, you know, in, you know uh, regarding the introduction of uh, hepatitis B birth dose one way or the other, or was this considered a fairly independent process from the COVID uh, response? Please. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, COVID response brought an extra burden on the NITAG. We are actually meeting weekly uh, to advise government on all issues to do with COVID vaccination and the stuff like that. As you know, all the controversies are around COVID and the vaccine. So they needed a lot of that advice. And like I was part of the, uh, the that committee, it's called COVAX, uh, sitting weekly, and then part of this uh, committee for FB. But we we look, we, we try to attend to the parties of the ministry. So we we did organize extra meetings in order to consider this uh, as an important issue so that the ministry doesn't say, let's say we are delaying the process. Uh, yeah, that is what we did. We had to sit uh, extra times, but also the virtual nature actually uh, provided an opportunity for people to attend meetings from wherever they were, as opposed to before. Thank you. I'm sure there's some other questions about the uh, unit tag process that we can get to in the discussion, but uh, let's move 
on to uh, 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 provide some highlights of some research as it relates to uh, prevention of mother to child transmission with uh, beginning with um, routine hepatitis B birth dose vaccination. Um, let me uh, turn to uh, my colleague, Dr. Yoshiki Shimagawa, who will give us an update on a potential uh, rapid diagnostic test to screen uh, hepatitis B infected women to identify those with high viral loads and at increased risk of mother to child uh, transmission. Uh, Yoshiki? Thank you very much, John, uh, for uh, inviting me to talk about this. Uh, this is slightly uh, beyond the scope of today's uh, meeting uh, topic. I'm sorry about this, but uh, still uh, this will be something which is very important. So, and uh, also thank you very much for John and Henry uh, helping us to complete this study. So this is about uh, preference, a survey on preference and characteristic of rapid diagnostic tests. So, uh, WHO uh, suggests incremental approach to prevent mother-to-child transmission. The most important intervention, obviously, is infant immunoprophylaxis, including uh, birth dose vaccine within 24 hours. And once uh, uptake high coverage of this intervention is achieved, what they suggest is to go to HBS antigen testing, linkage to care of mother and follow-up of infants. And then finally, uh, they suggest maternal antiviral prophylaxis if a pregnant woman have high viremia or positive for e antigen. And we were commissioned by the WHO to assess from which maternal viral load threshold there is substantial risk of mother-to-child transmission despite infant immunoprophylaxis, including both birth dose and immunoglobulin. Unfortunately, uh, our systematic review identified uh, most of the study are from uh, Asia or Europe and not, uh, not from Africa for this study, but we found that the risk of mother-to-child transmission despite infant immunoprophylaxis starts to increase from maternal viral load of 200,000 IU per meal. And consequently, WHO has made recommendation to screen mother pregnant women for HBV, and if mother found to be carries surface antigen, then they te test for uh, viral load. And for those who have high viremia above 200,000, uh, treat using antiviral therapy. But obviously, the problem of this recommendation is that most of the resource limited countries, there is limited access to HBV DNA PCR test. And therefore, we also assessed uh, another serological marker called hepatitis B E antigen, which has been known to uh, represent high, virem, high, uh, viral, high uh, viral replication. And we assessed the performance of E antigen test during pregnancy to diagnose high viremia of about 200,000 IO per meal. And we found through a systematic review and meta analysis that the pool sensitivity of this test was 88% and specificity was 93%. And based on this result, WHO has made a conditional recommendation that whenever there is limited access to HIV DNA PCR, women who are positive for E antigen should be uh, treated during pregnancy to stop mother-to-child transmission. But the problem of this work is that most of uh, the studies that we identified, they used laboratory-based immunoassay to detect E antigen, such as enzyme linked to uh, immunoassay or chemiluminescent enzyme immunoassay. And these laboratory-based uh, immunoassay should be a little bit better than PCR in terms of the accessibility, but still it cannot be the ultimate solution. And of these uh, studies that assessed performance of e antigen during pregnancy, there were two, tests, uh, two studies that used e antigen rapid diagnosis test, uh, lateral flow test. And unfortunately, uh, both uh, study found a very low sensitivity. Study by Alice Gingane in Burkina Faso found a 64 sensitivity, although specificity was good, 95%. And Olivier Sejeral in Cambodia found sensitivity of 76% and specificity of 97%. So the question is, uh, what would be the uh, acceptable trade-off? Because it is highly unlikely that we can have a perfect rapid diagnostic test alternative to a PCR, which has 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, 20 minutes time to result, and cost only one US dollar. It is unlikely for the next few, few years. 
Then the question is what, is, what would be the acceptable level of trade-off between these parameters? And we assessed uh, using a survey questionnaire, preference of healthcare workers practicing in Africa on four characteristics of rapid diagnosis test using a method called the discrete choice experiment. And we identified these uh, four parameters, price, sensitivity, and specificity, and time to result as important parameters. And for each parameter, we varied. For example, for price, we varied from one US dollar to 20 US dollar. Sensitivity compared to PCR, ranging from 85 to 100%. And each time for this questionnaire, we gave a quite precise scenario. Uh, and we say that you as a healthcare worker in charge of antenatal care in a primary care clinic in rural area of low income country. And in each year you identify about 1000 women uh, positive for surface antigen at your antenatal care. And of these HPV positive women, about 20% have high viral loads and therefore require antiviral drugs according to the recommendation. And the rest 800 women have low viral loads and therefore do not require antiviral drugs. However, most of women do not benefit from antiviral drugs because they cannot afford to bear the cost of PCR, which is 40 US dollars, let's say, and they cannot make a one-day trip to a district hospital for PCR. And you are now asked about your preference between two fictional hypothetical rapid tests as a tool to detect high viremic women uh, in your context. So each time we give uh, this uh, two different combinations. So this is an example. So this rapid test A, uh, fast um, uh, alternative test, uh, hypothetical test, it costs only one US dollar, it's very cheap, but it takes a little bit time, 60 minutes. And in terms of the under treatment, so 20% women who need antiviral drugs don't get them. So this translates into 80% sensitivity. Uh, so 20%, uh, false uh, negative rate. And uh, in the contrast, 10% of women get antiviral drugs they don't need. So this translates into 90% specificity. On the other hand, rapid test day, it costs much higher than test day. It costs 15 US dollars, quite expensive, but it gives you a result quite quickly in 20 minutes. And in terms of the uh, false uh, negative result, only 5%, so it means 95% sensitivity. And in terms of the specificity, it, it has the same performance. So which one would you choose? One cheap one with less performance or expensive one, high uh, performance? And we repeated this kind of different scenario seven times in order to understand the trade-off. And we could finally had uh, five, 550 uh, participants uh, throughout Africa, 60% are doctors, but we also had nurse, midwives, uh, lab staff, public health practitioners. We had over representation from West Africa, but we also had participants from Central, East, North, and South Africa. And about one third of uh, participants have never been involved with hepatitis B, and two thirds have worked for hepatitis B. So this is a main result uh, for sensitivity, specificity, and cost. And y-axis shows utility, so this is an indicator for this preference. So as expected, nothing uh, surprising uh, in terms of the sensitivity. Whenever sensitivity increases, the preference increases, obviously. So better sensitivity, people prefer. And interestingly, uh, this was quite linear. And in terms of specificity, also, of course, uh, better specificity, the people prefer. But it was not; uh, it was less linear. When uh, specificity is ninety-five percent, uh, there is a little bit more plateau compared to hundred percent. So people do care less for specificity. And in terms of cost, we also found uh, negative uh, linear correlation. So when the cost increase, people prefer less. And uh, I don't show you the detailed um, result. But what was interesting to, sh to, to, to show whether if uh, parameters that they uh, thought important varied between professions, and indeed it varies. Doctors, as you can easily expect, do care about sensitivity. They do not want to miss any patient who should be treated. But public health practitioners, they do care about money more than other healthcare workers. And midwives, 
they care about time to result compared to other uh, professionals. And we modeled uh, predicted probability of acceptance of a rapid test over PCR. And uh, uh, for this uh, scenario, uh, we set specificity as 95%, uh, time to result as 20 minutes. And we try to identify what would be the uh, minimal and optimal threshold for sensitivity for people to accept over PCR by ranging the cost from one US dollar to 20 US dollar. And we arbitrarily set as 70% predicted probability of accepting this test over PCR as a minimal criteria for uh, sensitivity and 90% uh, probability for acceptance as optimal one. And so this is a result by fixing again, specificity as 95 by 5%, time to result 20 minutes. Uh, if the test costs one US dollars, sensitivity should be at least 82% ideally 87%. And if the test costs five US dollars, uh, sensitivity should be at least 85% and optimal, uh, optimally uh, 90%. So by comparing uh, E-antigen rapid diagnosis tests that we found, test had specificity of 95%, time to result is 20 minutes, but the sensitivity that uh, uh, our colleagues have observed in Burkina Faso and Cambodia, it was between 64 to 76. So this is below the minimal uh, threshold uh, for uh, acceptance over PCR in our uh, questionnaire. So in summary, healthcare workers in Africa particularly care about sensitivity and cost. However, there is a diversity between the type of healthcare workers in terms of uh, different four parameters. And for a test providing the result in 20 minutes with a specificity of 95%, the sensitivity should be at least higher than 82.5% if this costs one US dollars, and more than 85% if this costs for five US dollars. And therefore, e antigen rapid diagnosis test, as it is, uh, is unlikely to meet these criteria. Therefore, there is a need for improvement in uh, sensitivity of e antigen rapid diagnosis test. And also, there are other uh, potentially interesting markers. And particularly, we have developed hepatitis B correlated antigen rapid diagnostic test recently with the Fumamoto University in Fuji Rebio. And this can be an interesting alternative marker. And otherwise, uh, if there is a, a rapid diagnostic test that can detect high level of hepatitis B surface antigen, then this can be also an interesting marker. I would like to thank uh, my colleague in Institut Pasteur and also uh, John and Henry for uh, helping to uh, formulate a questionnaire and disseminate the questionnaire, and also all our colleagues in HEPSANET uh, uh, group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yoshiki. Um, really, uh, uh, you know, excellent survey to look at preferences. Uh, we were happy to be part of that. Uh, you're really doing groundbreaking work to improve uh, screening uh, uh, to identify women with high viral loads uh, and uh, correlated antigen it was just one of those promising technologies that hopefully we can uh, explore together um, in the future. Um, thanks again. Uh, let's move on. Uh, there were some questions um, uh, in the chat about uh, birth dose coverage in the Gambia. We're uh, about to hear from Dr. Gabriel Nadal from Prolifica. Uh, in the Gambia about a study to estimate birth dose coverage uh, in the country. Uh, Gabriel? Hi, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, hello, everyone. I, I am Jibril. Um, I am a clinical research fellow with the Prolifica group at the MRC unit in the Gambia. I'll talk to you today about a study we did recently to assess the trend of hepatitis B birth dose vaccine coverage within the general population in the Gambia between 2015 and 2021. Um, I'm going to jump right ahead into it and focus everything on the Gambia. Um, so the Gambia is a very small country in Africa with a population of about the same size as some larger cities in other African countries. It's a very highly endemic hepatitis B um, affected country with a general adult population prevalence of about 8.8%. And I mean, amongst pregnant women of about between four and 5%. The Gambia has done um, several interventions in terms of controlling hepatitis B. 
being the first country to adopt um, routine infant hepatitis B vaccination in the early 1990s, thanks to the GHIS study that was a collaborative project with the WHO, the Ministry of Health and other partners um, that started between 1986 and 1990. And most of you would already know this study, but to summarize, it was um, a step wage trial designed to, route, to gradually implement routine infant hepatitis B vaccination in addition to the other usual EPI vaccines at the time. And by February 1990, hepatitis B vaccination was routinely given to all infants um, in, within the EPI program in the Gambia. The GHI study has now moved on to complete the phases two and three um, parts of the study, which looked at the um, effect of vaccination to prevent against chronic hepatitis B carriage and the reduction in the rate of liver disease progression, um, incidence and progression amongst vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated cohort. Um, when a few years ago, this slide is a bit um, dated, but Yusuke and colleagues looked at the coverage of hepatitis B vaccination within the um, EPI program, um, and specifically also looked at the timeliness of hepatitis B birth dose vaccine administration. And we found that whilst the Gambia has sustained very high rates of coverage of the infant vaccination, the rates of timely hepatitis B vaccine administered within the first 24 hours of life um, remain very poor at about 1% um, over a decade between 2004 and 2014. And when they looked at the factors as if it's low timely hepatitis B vaccination, they found that low maternal level of education, living in a rural setting that is distant from the place of vaccination, or being served by a vaccination center that does not have cold chain requirements or relies on a monthly tracking clinic by EPI officers were associated with low rates of timely hepatitis B vaccination. Um, since this study was published in 2016, a lot has happened in the Gambia in terms of the political will and the response to viral hepatitis control. Um, a national hepatitis control program has been set up within the National AIDS Control Program and a focal point has been appointed within the Ministry of Health in charge of viral hepatitis. The Gambia in 2018 launched the National Hepatitis Prevention and Control Policy and a Strategic Control Plan. Launch, not implemented, that's the key word here. Um, and over the years around 2018, 2019, the EPI program working with this newly set up National Hepatitis Control Program, um, drafted a strategy to implement birth dose vaccination in all health facilities and with EPI officers um, being appointed to major health, health centers and hospitals and being given motorbikes to cover smaller district health centers and smaller health posts. And there was a transition made to using the multi-dose hepatitis B vaccine vials um, which can be kept at room temperature for up to 28 days and with less concerns about wastage compared to the, the, the other um, vaccines. So our study, um, looking at the trend of hepatitis B birth dose coverage, um, wants to look at the impact of these, um, the political will, the, the policy, the strategic plan, and the and the strategies by the EPI programs. What impact has the has these had on the trends of timely hepatitis B birth dose coverage, and what are the factors still associated with delayed hepatitis B vaccine? administration and the impact of COVID-19, if any, on the trend of timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccination. In order to get the data at a population level, we use the HDSS system that is maintained by the MRC unit. And the MRC has four health and demographic surveillance systems in Farofenye. This is where Yusuke's study was done in 2015 in the Bansang and Base areas where they have larger population sizes and therefore a bigger HDSS cohort. And in West Kiang, all of these are in rural Gambia. And the HDSS data collects um, all pregnancy, births, deaths um, within their cohorts and their catchment areas. And in terms of deaths, they also do verbal autopsies. They document migrations into and outside of the HDSS areas. And importantly, they collect vaccination status and not just whether an infant has been vaccinated, but the dates of birth and the dates of vaccination. And in addition, they collect demographic data, which include the maternal age, educational level, socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, this represented a very good source of data for us to accurately estimate the proportion of birds, the proportion of newborns that receive a timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine and look at a few maternal 
factors that might be responsible for delayed vaccination. Um, therefore, between 1st of January 2015 and 31st of July 2021, within the three larger HDSS regions, there were about 66,590 births, of which we excluded 392. So 66,198 infants were included in this analysis. There has been a gradual increase in the proportion of um, in babies being born in either hospitals or health facilities over the years. And most of the babies are being born by spontaneous um, vaginal delivery with cesarean and other assistant births being relatively fewer as expected. In 2015, our findings are quite similar to what UCK published in 2016 with the mean, the mean um, birth dose coverage in the three larger HDSS regions being about 2%. We observe a gradual increase in the trend of timely birth dose vaccination to a peak of about 10% when all the three HDSs are combined. This black line here shows the, the diagnosis of the first COVID-19 case in the Gambia, shortly after which followed the lockdowns and the diversion of resources from other, other health, health sectors towards the COVID control programs. And we observe that there was a sharp reduction of the proportion of babies who received a timely birth dose vaccine after the diagnosis of the first COVID during the first wave in the Gambia. And when we separated the, the HDSS regions to look at the, the, the individual proportions within each region, we found that Bansang was performing relatively better um, with about 9.6% of their babies receiving, sorry, about 8% receiving their timely birth dose vaccine compared to others, for example, in Kiang. Um, which had about less than 1% of their babies having a timely birth dose vaccine. We observed in our data set that there were periods in which um, there was um, a marked change point in the proportion of babies receiving a timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine. So we observed about eight time points, time point changes, um, of which the most significant happened after the summer of 2019. And this would coincide with the time where the EPI program started implementing um, routine hepatitis B vaccine within health facilities. But as observed before, um, the sharp decline in, in the coverage of timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine due to COVID was, um, was about 50% with a mean proportion of 9% of babies receiving a timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine during the period immediately before the COVID um, wave started down to about 5% immediately afterwards. And we estimated that infants born immediately after the introduction, um, immediately after the onset of the COVID pandemic were two times less likely to receive a timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine compared to the group of infants born immediately prior to the COVID, COVID um, outbreak. In terms of other factors that affected delayed timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccination, we noticed that being born in a hospital um, increases your chance of receiving a timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine compared to those being born at home and being born over the weekend, especially on a Friday and Saturday, significantly reduced your chances of receiving a timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine by odds ratios of 4.8% if you're born on a Saturday and 2.6% if you're born on a Friday. So to summarize, the trend of timely hepatitis B birth dose coverage has improved since new measures were introduced in the Gambia between 2015 and 2018. However, coverage of timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccination remains very low in the general population living in the rural parts of the Gambia. Being born at home, being born during the weekends, um, increased chances of not receiving a timely hepatitis B birth dose vaccine. And obviously the COVID-19 pandemic significantly disrupted this trend um, of timely birth dose vaccine administration in the Gambia. We know that there are needs to develop and to implement the strategies in the control program and the policies and to introduce measures that will increase access to the hepatitis B vaccine in health facilities during weekends and for babies born out of facilities. Um, we had support from um, new partners for this, for this analysis um, especially Julian and Cecil, and um, with significant support also from the HDSS systems, that's Dr. Esu and Sarwar, 
and we thank our collaborators at the Ministry of Health and all the prolific partners in the UK, in France, and in Senegal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Um, um, and, you know, excellent uh, description of the coverage uh, trends in uh, the Gambia and then some of the challenges uh, as a result of, um, of, um, of COVID-19, uh, uh, place of delivery, and some other uh, key implementation factors that have to be taken into account to optimize coverage. And hopefully we can get back to that in the discussion. Um, uh, but let's move forward. I know you're also involved in the, um, in the uh, a study that's in um, late stages of the planning phase um, to um, evaluate the effectiveness of, of hepatitis B birth dose uh, vaccination in Africa. Um, uh, we're also uh, looking forward to being part of that study as well in the, in the coalition. I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Shabanti Nigam to, um, to give you an overview of the, of the, um, of the project uh, that will be uh, uh, launched in the coming months. Uh, Shabanti. Thanks, John. Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. So really thanks to um, John, Henry, Lindsay, and everyone at the, the coalition for giving me the opportunity to present um, what really is a, a new study um, uh, that is due to be launched. And so I'm presenting this on behalf of the whole study team. So the study is called Impact B, Immunization to Protect African Children from Transmission of Hepatitis B. Um, I'm a hepatologist and clinical academic at Imperial College London, but I work with many of you on the call um, on this project and others. So a bit of background, um, this is all familiar to you, but as you know, the WHO elimination targets aim for a less than 0.1% self antigen prevalence in children by 2030. But the current five-year-old self antigen prevalence in children is 2.5% in the African region. We, we know now that mother to child transmission is a major mode of residual transmission. Um, and this is partly due to the successes of infant vaccination, which has been very successful in reducing horizontal transmission. In the African region, coverage of mother to child um, in transmission prevention interventions is very low. And the low coverage, particularly of hep hepatitis B birth dose in Africa. I'm not going to go into them in detail because many of them have been covered very articulately already. Um, but the challenges include difficulty in administering them in rural settings or where out of facility births are high, lack of funding support um, and lack of awareness about the importance of hepatitis B. Um, also, um, what was really nicely brought up as well from the Uganda NITAG team was that most data on hepatitis B birth dose effectiveness is from Asia or North America. Um, in Africa, there was one controlled study by ECRA colleagues in Côte d'Ivoire, which looked at a group of children who got hepatitis B birth dose and infant vaccination and one who, a group that only had hep B3. And this actually showed quite high rates of failure amongst the hepatitis B E antigen positive mothers, despite um, a birth dose vaccination. So this is really where our study fits in. It's really to provide more data, supporting data about the effectiveness of hepatitis B birth dose in Africa. Now, these are just some results from a modeling study um, from our group looking at the impact that the hepatitis B birth dose scale up could have if it were to be scaled to the 90% aspirational WHO goals. On the left panel, we see a global five year prevalence. So in gray is the status quo and the, the pink line is to show the significant gains we could have from scaling up hepatitis B birth dose. And on the right hind panel, we show hepatitis B related deaths averted by um, scaling up birth dose. And this is um, broken down by different WHO region. And what we can see is the blue region, WHO Afro region, um, there's the most benefit that can be gained. Here, about half a million hepatitis B related deaths in Africa could be averted if birth dose were to be scaled up to 90%. Now, these disproportionate gains are obviously because there's a high burden and low existing coverage. So there's, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. 
So then this brings me on to the study, the IMPACT B study. Um, this is a multi-center study in Senegal, Gambia, and Ethiopia with collaborators throughout the world, and I'll come on to that. And the overall aims of the study is really to furnish important data gaps in Africa on the effectiveness of timely hepatitis B birth dose stratified by hepatitis B E antigen and viral load status. And this is really to allow better quantification of the impact of scaling up hepatitis B birth dose and therefore hopefully guiding polar policies both on introduction and scale up in the region. Um, as I mentioned, the Impact B study team um, involves a great collaboration um, between researchers in um, Senegal, Ethiopia, the Gambia, um, the coalition, including John Ward and Henry, the Institut Pasteur and the University of Oslo in Norway. So really it brings together a lot of expertise um, and we're excited to be, um, you know, trying to move forward with, with this important study together. So the overall study approach, we're looking at the comparison of hepatitis B mother to child transmission risk in children at nine months of age, born to hepatitis B surface antigen mothers who receive timely hepatitis B birth dose compared to those who only receive hepatitis B, um, uh, B3 starting at six to eight weeks of age. And in West Africa, so, so one important point to make is we, we don't think it's ethical to randomize um, babies to a birth dose group and a non-birth dose group. So we're using a sort of pragmatic observational design, um, building on existing programs. So in West Africa, we're working in Senegal and the Gambia, and here we're comparing outcomes in children who receive birth dose and who don't as part of routine immunization policy. We know from Jibril's great talk and you know, previous um, presenters that the coverage is suboptimal. In Gambia, it's quite low. In Senegal, it's a bit higher, but it's not, um, it's, it's not um, perfect. So we will have a group of children who receive it and children who don't. And this is a prospective methodology um, whereby we screen women antenatally and follow up the mother-child pairs. In Ethiopia, um, many of you might be aware and might be involved in, um, the Ministry of Health launched a pilot study um, whereby they were administering hepatitis B birth dose vaccination, universal um, policy without screening in certain pilot sites throughout the country. So here, what we're doing is we're comparing the outcomes in children born in the pilot sites, so children who received birth dose vaccination, versus children who didn't receive the birth dose in, the, in some selected non-pilot sites, both in Addis Ababa and in the Afar region. Here we adopt a retrospective methodology whereby we test the mother-child pairs at nine to 12 months of age um, and the antenatal screening results we would have taken um, from routine, routine services. So the primary research objective really is to evaluate the effectiveness of timely hepatitis B birth dose with respect to maternal surface antigen status, so an overall effectiveness, but importantly also with respect to key indicators that we know um, for increased transmission risk, namely maternal E antigen status and level of hepatitis B DNA. There are a few secondary research objectives, which we don't need to go into detail, but um, we'll be looking at the proportion of pregnant women who are at high risk of um, transmission, etc., and the coverage of um, both timely and untimely um, birth dose vaccine, as well as completion of the full hepatitis B schedule. This is just a bit of a busy slide, but it um, outlines a slightly different um, uh, study methodology for the two settings. On the panel on the left, as I mentioned, we have this prospective methodology where we want to screen over 8,000 women in each country using a rapid point of care test. They'll receive their vaccination um, as part of national policy, and then we will follow up the mother-child pairs. In Ethiopia, um, here we're selecting uh, mothers who were screened antenatally 
um, to be hepatitis B surface antigen positive, and we will test them, um, invite them for testing at the age of nine to 12 months. And here the sample size um, to determine the effectiveness is 26, um, 26, 260 surface antigen positive mothers um, in both groups. Um, again, the, the details are not important, but the analysis plan will be really to look at the MTCT rate risk um, at the age of nine months, um, according to whether they received a timely birth dose or not, and the hepatitis B E antigen and viral load status of the mother. And then we will determine the effectiveness of hepatitis B birth dose by comparing the transmission risks in these various groups. Now, of course, our primary objective is to look at the timely birth dose, so within 24 hours, but we're aware that many will get birth dose within 48 hours, within a week, within a month. Um, therefore, depending on the numbers in the group, there'll be subgroup analyses about the different um, timings of vaccination um, and effectiveness. So in summary, really, reducing hepatitis Hepatitis B mother to child transmission is an urgent public health priority globally and in Africa, um, as everyone on this call acknowledges. Um, we feel that there's a narrow window of opportunity to answer an important question of hepatitis B birth dose effectiveness in Africa. Um, and we hope that this collaborative study could contribute to increasing the evidence base and inform decisions about hepatitis B scale up in the region and the need for any further interventions. And really we see it as an iterative process whereby um, things are introduced, more data comes through and, and um, strategies can be refined. So I'd like to really thank um, all, all the collaborators um, who are in this and, and funding support from Gabby, the Vaccine Alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shapanthi. Um, I think you answered the question that uh, Rania Tulme had from CDC regarding we're going to, uh, to be recording the timing of hepatitis B birth dose vaccination, and and that's, I mean, down to the um, you know down to the minute or hour after delivery or. Uh, um, well, that, I guess that's to be discussed, but we're thinking more in the 24 hour scheduling um, because that's also how it's recorded in, you know, in the national reporting systems in these countries. Um, if there's an exact timing, then, of course, that would be that would be preferable. But we, we put the category of 24 hours or within a week. Great. Um... And just quickly, Shabanti, I think Jeff Dashinko has a question in the uh, chat as well. Um, um, that you might want to, um, I'll give you a moment to uh, read and comment on. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So the question is, uh, it's gone. Um, this will be an important study, however, without HVIG and or third trimester prophylaxis, what is the statistical projection within the study of MTCT from E antigen women or women with high viral load? So we, we determined our sample size based on um, uh, just the, the, the baby either receiving birth dose or not receiving birth dose. So we didn't include um, the third trimester prophylaxis because it isn't national policy in these countries in the countries that we're doing the study. Um, of course, if some women include uh, get tenofovir, we might screen, we might have screened them, but we'll have to exclude them for the primary analysis. Um, but obviously, national policy might change, and we have to keep abreast of um, development. I don't know if that's answered your questions, Jeff, but we can um, chat further. Yeah, thank you very much, and, and, and hopefully, we'll have some discussion time to go into a little bit more detail. But a very important study as. Um, you know, Peter brought up, you know, um, local data are important, African data are important, and we feel like this study will fulfill an important uh, data gap. Uh, thanks again, Shabanti. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Henry, to uh, introduce uh, the civil society organizations we're working with to uh, increase awareness of hepatitis B birth dose vaccination in uh, African countries. Peter, uh, Henry. Thank you very much, John. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, talk about some of the work that we've been doing to bridge science with advocacy uh, to help eliminate uh, mother-to-child transmission of hepatitis B virus. Uh, we have support from uh, the US CDC uh, together with other partners 
uh, supporting civil society organizations to create advocacy around hepatitis B, but those vaccines. We are developing messaging materials. Uh, and for those who are able to join early in the, in the beginning of this meeting, we had some very good uh, music coming uh, up. And this is uh, a product of some of the work that our CSOs are, have been doing. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the first um, uh, of the CSOs who have been working on this front. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Charles Adeji uh, to talk about uh, his work uh, at the Hepatitis Alliance of Ghana. Welcome, Charles. I thank you very much, Henry, and thank you for the opportunity. So, um, yes, we set up to uh, have an advocacy program in our country to influence the number of stakeholders to implement Hepatitis B BEV dose as part of the EPI. Next slide. So just, just a brief introduction of myself. I'm the executive director of Hepatitis Alliance of Ghana. Next. So if you look at Ghana, uh, since 2002, we started the implementation of the pentavalent vaccine at 6, 10, and 14 weeks. But BEVDOS is not part of our EPI program. There has been a number of calls over the years to convince governments to see the need to introduce the BEV dose as part of the EPI. So if you look at this particular project, what we sought to do was to increase political will uh, towards the introduction of the BEV dose, and then also to improve healthcare providers' knowledge on the vertical transmission of hepatitis B, and also create awareness about PMTCT of hepatitis B, particularly among pregnant women and women in their reproductive age. This so the first activity, which is increasing political will, next, what we did was to facilitate dialogue with key stakeholders on the relevance of incorporating hepatitis B BEV dose vaccine into the current EPI. But we situated this discussion within research. So the good news is that the coalition uh, came out with a profile, which is, gives you a summary of the burden of the condition in our context. And then again, other systematic reviews conducted in Ghana and meta-analysis also gives us the data about the population that are mostly affected with hepatitis B. And you could see that people who are in their reproductive age are the most affected uh, group. Now, again, if you look at the context where we don't have the BEV dose as part of our national policy, then those who matter when it comes to decision-making uh, were those we targeted. So first, we targeted the the National Varietal Control Program Manager. We had an engagement with him, both former and informal. And we even went a step further to create a platform for him to make a public pronouncement about the response of the country regarding PMTCT of Hep B. Again, we also talked to the presidential advisor on health and we made him aware that per the evidence we have, if you look at the benefits of the intervention, and that is the PMTCT or the introduction of the BEV dose, it outweighs the cost or the kind of investment that the government has to make. In fact, he was very surprised after we gave him the data that, I mean, why is it that as a country we've not been able to do this? And then right there, he instructed the director who is in charge of public health, Ghana Health Service, to ensure that next year this should not be part of the conversations regarding hepatitis B which we were very happy and satisfied about the response. Now, when we engaged the director of public health on so the Ghana Health Service, he was very clear that, well, they are very optimistic that next year they will have the introduction of the BEV dose. What is holding them is the national study, which they are currently conducting to have a picture of the burden of hepatitis B, particularly among pregnant women, so that they could lean on that to implement the BEV dose. And we said, well, that is a good, uh, you know, intervention or something to do, but we can still continue and then uh, check and uh, continue to see uh, newborns uh, getting this infection. So can't we lean on the existing data, which of course are segmented, but then the good news is that these data are also synthesized. So to a large extent, we can rely on the data for policy formulation. Whilst we wait for the national uh, data to give us a picture about the viral hepatitis burden in the population in question. 
And he, he assured me that COVID is also one of the reasons why, of course, the attention was shifted to other priorities. But hopefully next year, this will not be part of the discussion. And we're very grateful as well. We also engaged the WHO technical officer in charge of uh, hepatitis, HIV, and TB. And he, 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 he felt this is very disconcerting, particularly when there's an elimination target. And, and the only way we could obviously achieve that target is to have the mother to child transmission averted in our context. And he promised that he's going to also take this discussion to the higher level. I mean, when it comes to uh, policy discussions and make sure that this happens uh, uh, next year, God willing, latest. And then we realized that one important stakeholder, especially when it comes to uh, prevention of mother to child transmission is actually midwives. So we engaged the president of the registered Ghana Registered Mid Midwives Association. And she was so annoying to know that, I mean, such an intervention exists and then we are not doing it, anything about it. And said, look, create a platform for me and I will come and speak to my midwife. Whilst we wait for government intervention, I will encourage them to do something about it. And we created a platform and she was there as a, as a chair. And that particular platform was a hybrid seminar. And she spoke directly to the midwife that whilst we wait for government, do not sit down and allow children to be infected. And that was, we felt that that was a very great uh, message from her. Now, in terms of the healthcare providers, we had a hybrid scientific seminar for midwives across the country. But prior to this, we selected some rural communities where you could see only one midwife who is in charge of that particular clinic or that community. And we brought them together and trained them on PMTC. I was very surprised to hear that even those who are making attempts to give the birth dose vaccine, they were using the pentavalent vaccine as the birth dose vaccination. And that was very scary to some of us. Again, some of them were even emphasizing more on the monoglobulin without talking about the monovalent vaccine. So if the, the mothers are unable to afford the monoglobulin, the, what it means is that the vaccine is not even discussed at all. And so this training brought up a lot of information and we're very happy when we did the pre-test and post-test. We realized a knowledge increase in terms of the knowledge score, the composite score of about 35%, which we felt that was very significant. Again, we move to the next, which is to create posters and then have accurate information on PMTCT. And these posters, we already engaged the stakeholders. They've been back and forth. We are trying to have a more contested, uh, contextual information such that it can be made available in the health facilities. And this will be a good idea for the pregnant women themselves to read and then the midwife themselves to be reminded about their role to avert the transmission of the infection. Then we launched the Hepatitis B Bev Dose Champions competition. And this competition is inviting midwives across the country. What, whenever you talk about viral hepatitis in the antenna, whenever you intervene or you, you, you mount an intervention that is intended to prevent mother to child transmission, just take a short video of yourself, take a picture of yourself and share with the Alliance. And I mean the Hepatitis Alliance of Ghana. In October, we are going to select three of these midwives, including their facilities, and then acknowledge them and award them and make it public. This is just to set a model so that individuals will be encouraged as well to be interested in the elimination of hepatitis B. In fact, we did something at the national level when the coalition also worked, I mean, I mean the global coalition worked the glass, uh, ghastly to have a stakeholders meeting. So what we did was that as an alliance, there's this particular physician consultant, hepatologist, her name is Dr. Dreje, who has been speaking about viral hepatitis elimination in our contest. And we awarded her publicly as an elimination champion in our contest, which the award was presented by the presidential advisor on health. And this, we believe, is going to also encourage other physicians in the field to be committed to uh, hepatitis elimination in the country. Next slide. Now, another interesting um, is about increasing awareness of uh, prevention of mother to child transmission. And we did something unique this time around. We created an animation video in a local language just to emphasize on the, the message on PMTCT and particularly the relevance of the BEVDOS vaccine whilst we wait for the national scale up. 
And I want to thank the team from CDC and then the coalition for their input. It came out very well. In fact, we shared on different platforms. When I checked yesterday on YouTube alone, we've had more than 1,000 views within four days that we published this particular animation video. So it tells you that this particular intervention is likely to convey the message on PMTCT to the Ghanaian population. Then we've also done sensitization campaigns in schools and churches. And then again, we have the posters I mentioned, which is still under uh, review. And then the documentary as well, which is under review on PMTCT, which will also be shared to those who matter. Now, the lessons we have learned for the sake of time, uh, my next slide, please. We have learned that involving key stakeholders in the design and implementation of hepatitis related programs can foster a positive environment. This program we mounted, we involved the WHO office in Ghana, we involved the Ghana Health Service, we involved the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwifery Association, we involved other key stakeholders right from the planning through the implementation, and I'm sure that when we are doing the evaluation, we involve, involve them. And we think that that is what is accounting for the success. We also, we have also learned that educating healthcare providers, particularly midwife, has the potential to increase their confidence when it comes to PMTCT of HEP. Because realize that a number of them are not discussing the issue of hepatitis because they themselves don't, they feel that they don't know. And that's the case from the data we had. For instance, it's widely spread. I mean, it's a communication message that it can be transmitted sweat, through sweat. And obviously, this is one of the reasons why the stigma, you know, is being forward in our context. So, I mean, we realized that they were very confident. They were very enthusiastic that they are going back to their facility and make a change. And we have a number of testimonials. And the use of context-specific and nation videos increases viewers' interest thereby dispelling negative notions about hepatitis B, which of course I share that with you. And the media can be an effective tool for PMTCT or, or advocacy. And the reason why I'm saying this is because this particular media engagement we had, we had media houses, both print or audiovisual from more than 15 uh, media houses. And interestingly, all of them were interested about this issue and it was well broadcast in all the media houses and we felt we felt uh, very happy about it. So on this note, I want to thank the coalition and then the task force and CDC for their support and we'll continue to work together to eliminate hepatitis as a public health threat in Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles, um, uh, for your important uh, summary of the activities that you're doing indeed. Um, engaging and also coming from the charts that you've been seeing, uh, having political uh, buy-in in the activities to introduce back those is very important. Having uh, to target the various stakeholders uh, that are relevant uh, in terms of implementing the back those are also very important and creating uh, simple messaging and coming up with innovative channels or delivering these messages is really an example of what your work has uh, been uh, able to do. Um, next, I will want to invite um, uh, Emmanuel uh, from Uganda. Uh, he, the, the, he's going to represent the Hepatitis A organization in uh, showcasing some of the work they've been doing on this front. Thank you so much and welcome, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, that is not the presentation, Lindsay. I would request that uh, you share with me the presentation, the screen sharing op opportunity. Thank you very much. I um, hope everyone can see that. No, uh, it's loading. Just a minute. Yeah, it's, it's on now. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Luta Maguzi Emmanuel, and I'm the executive director at the Hepatitis Aid Organization a civil society organization that is supporting hepatitis elimination in Uganda. And I'm also a person living positively with hepatitis B and I got to know about my status in 2016. 
Uh, we are working together with the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination to scale up or to accelerate the introduction of the hepatitis B birth dose in Uganda in support with other partners and uh, the Ministry of Health. Who we are, we are a civil society organization supporting hepatitis elimination efforts in Uganda. We were founded in 2019 and we are a membership CSO with over 47 volunteers and we don't have any paid staff at the moment. Uh, we are having a representative at the National Hepatitis Technical Working Group at the Ministry of Health. And we are also members of the World Hepatitis Alliance, the Uganda Cancer Society, the Uganda Alliance of Patient Organizations, and the Uganda Hepatitis Consortium. Um, the hepatitis B birth dose in, uh, in Uganda, we currently have the NITAG recommend the, to MHH for the introduction of the hepatitis B birth dose. Uh, we have an existing program for hepatitis and a designated officer from uh, under the UNEPI or the Uganda National Expanded Program on Immunization. And they are our partners on this particular project. We have the triple elimination uh, prevention of mother to child transmission uh, program nationally running. And uh, hepatitis is one of the programs. So uh, hepatitis HIV and uh, syphilis and hepatitis is uh, one of them. Then we also have political will where the government is giving 10 billion to the hepatitis program, uh, which is good for a good start as we initiate the discussion on the hepatitis B birth dose. And then the hepatitis B birth dose is integrated in the new hepatitis national strategic plan 2022-2026. Some of the activities that we have to do or that we are engaging in, we are doing a knowledge, attitude and practice assessment. We are do, developing messages for target audiences. We are developing uh, IECs for target audiences still. We are having community activations in Kampala and Lira districts. And then we are also going to disseminate the IEC materials. Uh, we are having campaigns on social media, we are having campaigns on the traditional media, and we are also holding advocacy meetings with decision makers and supporters to gear or to accelerate the introduction of the hepatitis B birth dose in Uganda. Uh, some of the materials that we have to do are the jingle, posters, stickers, audiovisual materials, radio spots, that are going to be translated or that are translated in Luganda and Lango languages. Luganda is a local language that is used mainly in Kampala and the Lango language is a language that is used mainly in Lira districts. And uh, on the side is one of our uh, volunteers. He's called Dr. Jamada Aldin with a very good message that everyone should hold. We want the best for our kids. And then uh, some of the advocacy or uh, communication channels that we are using, we are using radio, we are using television, newspapers, social media, health centers, and targeted meetings. And on the side is one of the uh, 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 media engagement where Dr. Jamada Aldin was spreading some good news about the hepatitis B birth dose at one of the events that we held last week. Um, these are some of the pictorial views of um, engagements that we have had in the community, and these are engagements in Lira District. Uh, on the, uh, we have engagements with the uh, health workers. We have engagements with uh, on the top right, it, the engagements with journalists, and then below these are engagements with uh, the community health teams, and the community health teams are part of the are the ones that make the village health teams at the district level. And these are the first people that are reached out to by the community on issues pertaining the health in, in our country. We have had a hepatitis gala, and uh, this gala was a football gala where we saw a good um, uh, a turn up of the community. We had free vaccination of hepatitis, free testing of hepatitis. We also had uh, uh, support from uh, different partners. Uh, you can see some of the members from Lugay Foundation. This is a so, uh, civil society organization in Uganda, but they are one of the people that gave us financial support to have this actually uh, uh, executed. 
we had uh, a turnaround of uh, about 12 teams, uh, local teams that are uh, registered for this football gala. And uh, one of the photos, you are sh it shows uh, some of the teams that uh, won and they were raising high in jubilation. And uh, we also had our guest of honor as Dr. Godfrey Yiki, who is a regional vaccine service delivery ad uh, senior advisor at USAID in Africa. So uh, we started and initiated discussions, though he's currently uh, leading the COVID team, but we have started discussions to see how we can also talk about the hepatitis B birth dose after this event that we had. We have had community uh, activations with the youth, and this is one of the activities that we did for the World Hepatitis Day at uh, uh, Makere University Business School. Uh, and we had uh, one of the legislators, the area MP or the area member of parliament, Honorable Balimwez Ronald, the Nakawa East uh, legislator who officiated this event and uh, he gave his support and commitment. He actually asked that we wrote uh, a motion and he tabled it to parliament for the introduction of the hepatitis B birth dose in Uganda. Uh, we were also having in presence uh, Minister Lyomba Godfrey, who is the speaker uh, of Nakawa Division. Uh, Nakawa Division is one of the, of the constituencies uh, of the Kampala Capital City Authority, the leadership authority in Kampala. And uh, it was a very good event. We also had support from private sector. We got some financial support from Equity Bank. We got uh, support from uh, the Uganda uh, Blood Bank, the National Blood Bank and Transmission Services. Uh, we got some support from Masters Medical Center, which gave us medical health workers who were doing HIV testing because we are also looking into integration. They were also, uh, we, we got a team that was doing COVID-19 and this was a follow up of the meeting we had had with uh, Dr. Godfrey Yik, who sent this team. And uh, pretty much these photos can show you the turn up of uh, the young people. And we also uh, got some positives from these young people. Uh, I can also assure you that uh, we were able to equip the, the health center at the, at, the, at the university with testing kits and uh, vaccine, vaccines because it was having challenges with, uh, with uh, getting these commodities. And uh, the ones that we used were left at the facility to continue uh, give, uh, giving the service to the students. So in conclusion, next week we have a high level meeting. Uh, we have engaged uh, the, the head or the chairman of the health, uh, parliamentary health committee, uh, Honorable Dr. Charles Ayume, who proposed that we have a high level meeting next week at parliament with the Ministry of Health and uh, some key uh, civil society personnel to discuss on the introduction of the hepatitis B birth dose in Uganda. And uh, we only hope for the best. We, 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 we are yet to have this meeting and share updates in our normal meetings, uh, Mr. Henry. And then uh, also uh, by the end of this, this project we, that we shall have developed and distributed 1,000 stickers, three radio spots, one jingle, 1,000 posters, three audiovisual materials. We hope that we, we will have had um, uh, built the capacity of over 200 health workers, 100 village health teams, uh, 100 community stakeholders, and uh, 200 journalists from both Kampala and uh, Lira districts. We also hope that by the end of this project, we shall have had 3,000 people reached through nine radio talk shows uh, with accurate hepatitis B birth dose information. 1,000 people will have been reached with uh, two television talk shows with hepatitis B birth dose information. 1,000 people will have been reached with uh, two newspaper publications with hepatitis B birth dose information. And uh, I must also share that all these events got good publicity uh, in the local media. And uh, we are able to, to get radio, radio, radio publicity, TV publicity, and also good, uh, newspaper, both online and print, which we shall also share. And last but not least, we expect to have 5,000 people reached with hepatitis B birth dose information in a two months social media campaign that we are already running or that is already in progress. 
Thank you very much for listening. I remain Luta Moguzi Emmanuel, and I'm the executive director at the Hepatitis Aid Organization. And I urge everyone who is here to speak up and stand up to hepatitis because your voice really matters. Don't wait. Please test, vaccinate, and treat if you're positive with the hepatitis B virus. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, have a good day. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, I think what you've been doing is wonderful. Uh, we have a lot of information there in scientific journals and uh, some of this information becomes very hard to translate uh, and make uh, the person who is really most affected to be able to get the message. And I think your efforts have been able to uh, simplify this and come up with very, very, very nice products. I think at the point, uh, maybe as we wind up our meeting, we'll have the video played. The song track in that particular video uh, is a product of... Um, of, of the hepatitis aid organization. And really, we do appreciate that. Uh, before I invite the next speaker, I'd, I'd like to let you, uh, to ask you to request you uh, after the next speaker, if we could have our videos on, I uh, will really appreciate if you could take uh, some snapshots or uh, screenshots of, of your pictures, uh, but, but that will happen after the next speaker. Uh, and that next speaker is going to be Maziko uh, Hisborn. Uh, of uh, uh, Health Rights Education Program in, in, in Malawi. Uh, Maziko, this is your opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry, and um, uh, greeting to everyone. Um, I'm humbled um, to make this presentation on behalf of HREP, uh, the staff of HREP, but also for Malawi Civil Society. And I'm also very humbled uh, that um, on the on the call, we have the Minister of Health, uh, we, which we're working together to make sure that hepatitis B uh, elimination, but also looking at um, the introduction of, um, of birth dose. Um, I'll go quickly because I know we are running out of time uh, that um, already the Dr. Robson Kachala uh, mentioned uh, some of the key uh, events around hepatitis. Um, I will try to also to summarize some of the engagement which we had with his department, the Department of HIV and Hepatitis, because they combined the Department of HIV and Hepatitis. Uh, we had opportunity of meeting the Minister of Health, uh, two directorate, the Director of HIV and Hepatitis, but also the EPI program for immunization. So also we wanted to test and to find out um, the background of why I think in Malawi didn't have the first place to have best dose as, a, as, a, as one of the uh, program within the EPI program. So uh, Dr. Kachara made mention of um, some of the uh, uh, activities uh, roadmap uh, which they're trying to do. And um, we happen to have, next slide please. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide please. Yeah, as the background, um, we are Health and Rights Education Program, a local civil society uh, organization based in Malawi uh, since 2006. Um, and uh, we are involved in advocacy and we have been um, involved in the launch of pantavalent uh, measles second dose and other you know, vaccines in Malawi, including COVID-19 being the recent one. And um, Yes, we had um, this campaign. I uh, want to thank CDC and uh, the tax force and the elimination of hepatitis uh, for us to allow us to be part and parcel. We are aware that um, I think uh, hepatitis has been vaccinated at six uh, weeks to 10 and 14 weeks. Uh, but um, as you know, it is important, um, as I think the previous speakers has mentioned, that um, we need to have it at, 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 at birth. And um, I want also to say that um, the Minister of Health ably mentioned that we don't have it. It means that that campaign makes sense because we've got to be, I think, doing things which I think already been done. But the acknowledgement from the Minister of Health, Dr. Kachala, made mention that um, that is still in the pipeline, which needs a lot of awareness and advocacy around it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, I think um, the goal is to have uh, a community 
uh, that is uh, um, more aware of hepatitis, but also most importantly, uh, to have the best dose as routine uh, in the literary immunization program, uh, which currently at the moment as we're talking is still yet, is yet to be included as Dr. Gachara has mentioned, that efforts have been made. So it requires more advocacy from policymakers, uh, from donors, the government, and other stakeholders, including civil society and communities to appreciate. So the target good are women and uh, key population and uh, community members, but also we're also trying to target health workers, but also high level officials, that Ministry of Health, World Health Organizations, and other key stakeholders. So to make sure that this becomes successful. Next, please. That's our audience. Yeah, so some of the things which we are trying to do is uh, to develop posters and flyers. Uh, I think we have already shared with uh, uh, with Henry and John and Lindsay on what we have done so far uh, in terms of producing those materials. And uh, we also pre-tested them uh, with the, uh, the, min the, the Minister of Health, more especially the district health offices, so that to appreciate. And I'm happy to share that all the district uh, medical officers we have, have made so far they have acknowledged that indeed this campaign is important in raising awareness because most people don't know and that there is a huge number of people and even Dr. Kachara mentioned in his earlier presentation that uh, we need a lot of awareness of hepatitis and also I want to share that uh, one of our staff members, um, the brother died of hepatitis some time back. So when we launched this campaign within the organization, we also have um, someone who have died of this disease. So we are also uh, passionate about it because uh, one of our officers' uh, uh, brother died of the disease. So it is it is called to home, apart from maybe advocating outsiders on raising awareness. Next, please. Next, please. You can go to the end of our presentation so that uh, we are quick because I know we don't have much of a time because some of these materials were already shared. Uh, you can go next. Next, these are some of the community initiatives we have done, and uh, on that one, um, we uh, we got involved in the 28th of July hepatitis day, uh, which was very successful, and um, the media have captured it. Uh, those both um, uh, radio, TV, uh, but also print. So already we have received a lot of uh, a lot of feedback uh, from 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 the health organization, Minister of Health and other stakeholders. But I'm also happy to report what Dr. Kachara has mentioned, uh, that um, Minister of Health will be launching uh, the strategy uh, at the uh, day when the ministry want to have the commemoration. So we have enabled uh, that, and uh, they've already been invited us to be part and parcel of that, of, of that launch, uh, which is be an opportunity for us to showcase what we have done as advocates as civil society organization, but also maybe to include in, uh, and invite community members and health workers to speak more about this. So it's an opportunity which I believe I'm told to be at the end of this month, uh, where the Minister of Health will be launching uh, the guidelines, but also the strategy on the hepatitis, more especially at birth doors. So as civil society, we still have a role to play in continuing making sure that we make sure that we have more awareness and uh, the media which we meant recently they even acknowledged that uh, they are hearing some of this information for the first time, looking at the how, 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 how dangerous the disease is, uh, the hepatitis, but they haven't had um, uh, many awareness in terms of making sure. So we think that is also an opportunity to raise more awareness among the media fraternity so that they should start writing more about uh, hepatitis, which is an opportunity for us because they acknowledge that um, most of these things are things are not proper. In fact, today, um, in the, our national uh, national TV uh, uh, station, there will be a, uh, um, the story about this this day and also about hepatitis, which we are trying to create the momentum so that when we they'll be launching, the means they'll be launching. And we're also trying to think that uh, at, at the sideline of launching the hepatitis strategy and guidelines, we wanted to have a, a, a focused discussion within Minister of Health uh, health workers who have met, uh, but also community members, so that at least we continue raising awareness. So yes, indeed, we believe uh, this is important. Next, please. Next slide, please, Leslie. Yeah, so those are the next one, yes. 
Yeah, so those are some of the materials you have uh, produced so far uh, for hepatitis in Malawi, raising more awareness, and um, we will do more, and uh, we'll be producing more. And thanks so much, CDC, uh, the tax force, and also the elimination uh, uh, for guiding us, but also providing the much needed really technical and financial support so that we're able to deal with this issue, which is very important. And um, I also I want to acknowledge the Minister of Health uh, for uh, putting a department within HIV uh, to be dealing with hepatitis, where Dr. Robson Kachala and uh, uh, Dr. Mzumara are part of that team. So we thank so much, Henry. I uh, hope we haven't uh, taken much time. I know we are running over time. Thank you so much for giving us Malawi Civil Society to speak on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Maziko. Um, we, I, like, uh, we have to apologize on behalf of uh, my team uh, that you're going to run out of time. Uh, we are already running out of time. Uh, but we will. Uh, we hope uh, that you can be able to uh, give us a few more minutes to be able to wrap up this. Uh, and quickly, if we could have our videos on now, uh, Lindsay, please, uh, if you're able to, uh, it would be nice to uh, take a screenshot. Um, so have your smiles uh, uh, as you celebrate um, uh, the, this initiative, uh, this community of practice uh, in supporting Bathos introduction in Africa. Uh, so it's a, um, um, and, and Lindsay, let me know uh, once you're, you're ready. Uh, go ahead. All right. One, two, three. All right. <laughs> okay. One more. One more, I think. One more. Um, yes. Uh, just yeah. one second. Yes. Just take the one photo. Okay. Right. Right. Second one, one, okay. two, three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Yeah. Uh, let's you. move to the next. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Let's move to the next presenter. Uh, and if you have uh, two minutes, if you can uh, summarize some of your work, and then thereafter we'll have Kenneth Kabagambe. Uh, if you is representing the Care for Social Welfare International in Cameroon. Welcome, if you Thank you very much, Henry. Good afternoon. Okay. Actually, I don't have a slide for this because I've not been in the best of health, but to just round up on activity for some time on hepatitis advocacy visits in Cameroon. On World Hepatitis Day, we had a seminar presentation, which I'll share the pictures with you with healthcare workers. And we have a lot that we've discovered on it regarding the bed dose vaccine, which is currently ongoing. For example, like positive mothers are actually giving the vaccine together with another, the baby together with another injection in an immunoglobin to support them. And outside that, to raise the awareness, we are now engaging the CRTV, which I'll be forwarding the dates and time which will be airing at their prime time. This prime time will be targeted at 7.30 and then 8.30 PM. We are targeting an audience of at the national level, that's the entire Cameroon. Mm -hmm. That's immediately after, before the prime time, that's before their news time, to be able to air a one minute jingle radio advert on hepatitis Bergdus vaccine. So the aim of this is that it targets both the healthcare workers, those in politician and the general public. They'll be receiving the same message through the CRTV. And then an estimated audience of at least 500,000 and above tune in to watch the news channel. So that would be a great opportunity for us to that because we've been trying to assess the number of people it can get, which we finally received. And then also, in regards to that, there is an IZ material that will be sharing which we want to distribute across the healthcare hospital that we visited, that we had seminars shared with they, they've agreed on it, like more of a poster to place it at the antenatal ward. But that will be shared a few, few days with you to see if there's any update or adjustment on it for it to be done. And then we are planning on running a news promo that will run for 24 hours, a news bar. That will be 24 hours. We also developed the message I will share immediately on our monthly meeting with you. 
that will run 24 hours on the screen for the TV. They should give access to anybody that tuned the television at any time or any place to be able to see the message and promote it. And then for the advocacy to the Minister of Health, there have been a, a lot of readjustment within the public health sector. And a lot of directors have been changed. So we have not been able to repay them a visit back to find the update. And then with the API expanded in um, expanded program on immunization, yeah, we contacted them and they've given us highlight. They are working with some committee, but we are not yet ascertained if it's the nitric that they are working with the recommendation or that they are working with other body. But already there have been a constitution of committees that they are working together to pilot the first phase of the vaccine, hepatitis dose vaccine. So, so far, these have been our activities and I hope I will share some of other detailed information for you to see. Thank you very much, Ipiani. Yes. Um, and thank uh, you very much. Thank you so much. I think uh, we have a lot of products coming from you. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, we also appreciate CDC for uh, reviewing some of these materials. Uh, I want to invite Kenneth. And uh, then the last uh, and not least is going to be Arafat. Uh, Kenneth, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Henry and the coalition for giving us the opportunity to share some of our, our activities, but foremost, we want to also thank you for the support uh, towards these, uh, these uh, activities that we are about to start implementing in the East African community. So uh, I'm going to be so brief because our, our activities are not so many anyway. So first and foremost, uh, we are, have already started engaging the ministries of health, uh, especially the EPI focal persons at the ministries of health in all the uh, uh, East African countries, excluding uh, DRC because of the language barrier issues. So we thought uh, we should not focus on DRC because of uh, the French uh, speaking, because we do not have uh, translation uh, services uh, during the, uh, the, the webinar that we intend to hold. Uh, but for sustainability purposes, we thought we should also engage the East African community uh, as a community because uh, it has a fully fledged uh, Department of Health and uh, already engagements are ongoing and we hope that uh, they will be part of uh, the, 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 the webinar that we are planning and also take up uh, or own up uh, initiatives on hepatitis B uh, birth doors. Um, we have also reached out to WHO uh, focal uh, officers on uh, HIV and hepatitis. So they are also going to be part of this uh, meeting. And uh, we believe that once we have uh, these uh, stakeholders on board, we shall have a sustained uh, advocacy within themselves and they will own up the initiative of introducing the hepatitis B pathos. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Uh, and finally, uh, Arafat, over to you. Uh, yes, you're on mute, Arafat, if you can unmute yourself. Arafat, we can't hear you. You're still muted. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, Arafat, your, your microphone is not so clear. Um, if you could move closer to it, probably that will make it better. For having some technical difficulties, that's making it difficult to 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 hear you fully. Um, so we can try once more, uh, but um, well, let's see. I think here. Let's try once. 
see if that works, Eric. Uh, if not, we'll have to uh, move on due to the lateness of the uh, program. Uh, but try once more, please. So, yeah. apologies, Arafat. I believe the technical difficulties are again making it difficult to, to hear you. I think since we're over time, we'll have to uh, to move on to the wrap up. But we'll um, we'll seek to um, get a better recording of your presentation so we can and your comments so we can put it, you know, as part of the um, part of the archive of uh, of this webinar that will be on our our website. So um, uh, so we'll you know. Um, so we'll help uh, others be more aware of your efforts there uh, in that way. Um, Henry, I'll give you, uh, I'll turn it over to you for a moment for some final comments, and then we will uh, uh, wrap it up. Thank you, John. And I think that wraps up um, our community engagement of uh, bridging science uh, to uh, advocacy uh, to promote uh, hepatitis B pathos introduction. Uh, a tool that is really going to help us um, eliminate uh, viral hepatitis. I think uh, the work that our civil society organizations are doing uh, is laying uh, the foundation uh, for countries that are planning to introduce the birth pills to be able to use this opportunity, the resources that they have uh, developed to be able to promote a birth pills introduction so that when they are ready to do that, the uptake of this particular vaccine will be much, much more uh, because the healthcare workers will be aware, uh, pregnant women and their families will be aware, and of course the policymakers, the, uh, the, the, the policymakers will be also aware about the battles because of this work. And I think this work is very important. It should be a continuous process, and we hope that we can get uh, more people supporting this activity going forward. Thank you so much, John, and I over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks to all the. Speakers, I think uh, the, the, this program demonstrates uh, why a community of practice for hepatitis B birth dose uh, introduction is so important, and how the uh, how the various uh, organizations and uh, health systems and individuals are growing to work on uh, implementing this key intervention that makes elimination of mother to child transmission uh, possible. Um, you know, we will, we look forward to. Uh, future convenings of the community of practice and bringing you up on um, the status of introduction, uh, how that's going, lessons learned from it, and some of the operational research outcomes that were touched upon uh, today, as well as uh, the really the um, extraordinary work of the civil society organizations that um, just gave you a glimpse of how with a modest investment of money, what a large uh, array of innovative products they can um, pr uh, produce uh, to uh, increase awareness of the benefits of hepatitis B birth dose vaccination. Uh, so thank you all again for joining. Again, you can get the um, um, products of this webinar on uh, our webinar uh, on our website at Global Hep. Uh, thanks to, thank you again. I think we'll just turn it over to, our, uh, as we started the program, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, let's continue our commitment to uh, free the next generation of hepatitis B uh, in Africa. Thank you. Free the next generation. Free the next generation. Free the next generation. I can hear the children of Malanda crying. Cause I'll leave a failure and I've done no pain. Mother to child at back transmission. 90% of them with lifetime infection. But all oh, matters, it's a happy day. A happy day. Introducing day. hepatitis B by oh, oh. We have got, we have got the vaccine, vaccine now. Hey, hepatitis B is one now. No more liver cancer now. Now, yeah, hey. let our babies have a smile, smile. like a bird up in the sky. Yeah, hey. Everything will be alright. Right. Let our babies yeah. have a smile. Smile. Hepatitis B can be prevented through a timely vaccine given to babies in the first 24 hours of life. We call upon government to introduce the hepatitis B backdoors. This will give every child an equitable chance to survive and thrive in life. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health in partnership with the Hepatitis Aid Organization with support from the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination and CDC. Okay. 
Free the next generation. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. Look forward to working with you all. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye to all. Goodbye to everyone. Thank you.